I'm Kenneth Yong, and I'm the chef for the Supper Club Corn and Mixup Chef. So my wife and I have been doing this for the last five years. We have guests come over to our home and we host a nice dinner for them. As a chef, I'm very curious about the origins of food and how history sort of influenced the way they are. So we, we like to do authentic plastic dishes from around the world, from places that we've been to, and we bring them back to Singapore. But throughout my time, I've been looking at cuisines from outside of Singapore, and I think it's time that I sort of look at my own history. So for my next dinner party, I want to throw a colonial banquet for my friends. So I'm very curious about what the colonial ate during the time here in Singapore, and what kind of food do they serve at all the lavish banquets they must have during the glory days, and how has that influenced the cuisine today? So I imagine these banquets to be very lavish affairs. With swanky decor and fancy British colonials seated around a very fancy table. And the food I imagine would be typically British, each dish a piece of art on its own. With maybe a roast pig with an apple in his mouth in the middle of the table. So for me, I see the world through food. Through food, you can actually see the culture, the history, and the values of the country, in a sense. And more often than not, there's a lot more history than we think. I admit, I don't know a lot about our former colonizers beyond, you know, raffles. Were they as indulgent as I imagined them to be? So I meet with the woman with all the answers, Gretchen Liu. Morning. Morning. I'm looking to recreate a colonial banquet. What do you know about it? Well, a colonial banquet would be a banquet that was given during the colonial era, and they okay. were elaborate. I can imagine. And most of the important banquets would have been given at government house, which we now call the Istana, which was the resident of the, you know, the governor of the straight settlements. But we also have, um, you know, some of the hotels, the raffles, the Adelphi, and they would often prepare elaborate yeah. meals in celebration of sort of so-called colonial events, you know, the coronation of a king or the king's birthday dinner. So are there any major colonial banquets in the course of history in Singapore that I should look at? Well, I think we can focus on the visit of the Prince of Wales in 1922. He was the most senior royal to visit Singapore during the colonial era. And so here you see the, um, the Prince of Wales. Oh, it's yeah. quite short, huh? Yeah, very, very short compared to uh, <laughs> the people surrounding him. The Prince of Wales, I learned, was a future King Edward VIII, famously remembered for abdicating his throne in 1936 to marry the woman he loved, the American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. But in his early years, basically he was like a global star, and the colonial government went all out to entertain the prince. Gretchen shows me how Singapore has transformed for the prince's visit. Streets were adorned with colourful decorations and festive arches were erected by Singapore's communities welcoming their prince. And most special of all, iconic buildings were swathed in electric lighting, still a new and special technology in 1920s Singapore. So I think just looking at some of these images, you get an idea of really how significant you know, this visit was. So it really was you know, the heyday of uh, the British Empire in, 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 you know, this part of the world. The prince, Gretchen tells me, spent two days here, and everything in his packed itinerary was reported and photographed in detail. He opened a trade exhibition. He said hello to his adoring subjects. And he also unveiled the World War I memorial by the Singapore River. I never knew that. So obviously, while the prince is in Singapore, he, he needs to eat. Yeah. So his first night in Singapore, there's a banquet at Government House and a state ball, which may well have been one of the biggest entertainments during the colonial period. In writing about it, they say Government House has surely never been so densely thronged as last night. The banquet, Gretchen tells me, was supposedly enormous. Many hundreds of the who's who of Singapore attended the dinner, so many, in fact, that it caused a jam on Orchard Road coming to the Istana. And after the banquet was the grand ball, 
which it was said the prince thoroughly enjoyed dancing five dancers with charmingly dressed ladies well into the night. What's interesting also about the report is that everybody in attendance is actually mentioned. No food is mentioned, but... What? So they printed all the names, but they did yes, not mention yes, anything yes. about the menu. Right. Names, titles, and all of that, but not one word about what was served to the guests. But what I noticed is that in the early 1900s, Singapore was already importing things from all over the world. Yeah. And there were like French bakers in Singapore. There were Italian people. There was a Jewish population. There were people from the Middle East. So the culinary scene per se was probably quite interesting. You know, so what was served at Government House, we, we kind of, we have to leave to our imagination. So due to the importance of the Prince of Wales visit, it is going to be the banquet I'm trying to recreate. But there was no mention of the menu that was for the banquet. So I'm a bit upset about that. But question shared me how cosmopolitan Singapore was. So I imagine the food that was served to the Prince of Wales might be very exciting, full of different cultures and cuisines um, to showcase what Singapore was really was during the time. So now, I need to find out just what kind of food was served at fancy banquets in 1920s Singapore. I run a private supper club called The Mixed Tip Chef. And for my next event, I've decided to recreate the grand banquet that was held for the Prince of Wales when he visited Singapore in April 1922. No menu of the banquet survived, but I've learned that the Raffles Hotel also hosted colonial banquets. So I meet with the hotel's resident historian to find out what kind of food was served at these dinners in the 1920s. So I'm looking to recreate the banquet of 1922 when the Prince of Wales came to Singapore. Would you know anything about it? Well, he had a very, very tight program when he came to visit Singapore. He did not have the opportunity to come to Raffles Hotel. But the first proprietors, the Sakis brothers, were very smart. What they did, they organized a special dinner in his honor. Ah, okay. And as you know, a lot of British here in Singapore, it was a success. In fact, Leslie tells me that Raffles Hotel was the meeting place for the British in colonial Singapore. And that the Prince's dinner was just one of many, many special banquets thrown by the hotel over the years. They had fancy dress parties, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then also, they went something unusual. They had skating dinner, roller skating dinner. Here in the lobby, because the lobby had marble flooring. It's more scratches. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that is why during the first restoration, we had to change the marble flooring. <laughs> for the banquet to celebrate the Prince of Wales' visit, would you have the menu for that? Well, I actually don't know the menu of the <clears throat> food they serve, but the sakis was always thinking to give the British guests the best. So, they brought in French chef to work in 1899. So the best food is French cuisine? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that French chef, that swipe attracted a lot of British because they wanted a fine dining. So for the banquet in 1922 to celebrate the Prince of Wales' visit, is it likely that the dinner was purely French cuisine as well? Correct. French cuisine, because this is a very special occasion and they did prepare a special menu. It was very successful. I'm a little bit disappointed that it is likely the Prince of Wales was served French cuisine during his banquet. I mean, after it started as a fanciest cuisine during that time, but I was hoping to see more of our local heritage being mingled with the colonial rule and if there's anything interesting that have come out of it. Call me stubborn, but I still want to believe that the Princess Banquet was a bit more diverse than these early 20th century menus in front of me. So I head to the National Library to do a little bit more digging. And I find a very interesting article about a lunch the prince attended on his second day here. So this lunch, it was tastefully decorated, which suggests to me that it was a very fancy affair. And here we have the menu actually, uh, which it's very interesting as I professionally adjust the focus. Consume frede le gelé and medallions and something something. All very French. Except one dish, gula malaka. I know that word, 
But what is Gula Melaka? Isn't it just sugar? Surely the Prince of Wales wasn't served chunks of raw sugar. Right? That is the question to be found out. <laughs> to solve this sugary mystery, I meet with librarian and custodian of rare books, Janice Liu. I saw this menu from the luncheon that the Prince of Wales attended, and there was this dish called Gulor Malaka. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know about it? Actually, I found the recipe in this, uh, the MEM's own cookery book. MEM is actually a term used by non Europeans to refer to white European housewives in mm -hmm. Malaya. It was a very popular cookery book. The one we have here is actually the third edition, which was published in 1929. But the first edition was published in 1920. So you see Gula Malaka here, it actually refers to a sago pudding that is eaten with coconut oh. cream and palm sugar syrup. So it wasn't served just the sugar by itself, is it? The syrup keep, keep itself, sugar, is yeah. it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of simply being plain palm sugar, Gula Malaka was actually a pudding. Made of the humble sago palm, pressed into fancy molds, and served with coconut cream and gula malaka syrup. So it's actually quite similar to what we have today, isn't it? Mm. Uh, what we have for right now. Sago pudding. Yes. Actually, gula malaka is an example of uh, colonial cuisine in British Malaya. Mm -hmm. Colonial cuisine is sort of like the precursor of the fusion foods that we have today. Janice explains that British colonial cuisine is actually a unique hybridized cuisine that combined the culinary traditions of Britain with those of the British colonies of India and Malaya. In the case of Gula Malaka, right, it uses local ingredients, your yep. sago, your coconut cream and your palm sugar to create a European pudding. And in addition to Gula Malaka, other hybridized colonial dishes included Mulukatani soup, a light curry soup invented in Madras that was served with rice and anything from chicken, mutton or fish. Kajiri, a favourite comfort food of rice, smoked fish and eggs that was adapted from the Indian vegetarian dish, Kichiri. And the Malayan curry puff, supposedly invented here because the British wanted a version of the samosas they used to have in India. A lot of these dishes, right, they are hybrid because they would have had to make do with the ingredients that were locally available. And I would think that it's a sort of negotiation between the mems and the cooks because um, the cooks who have been the ones doing the marketing. Lo and behold, there was even a book for that. So this is actually Malay for mems. It sort of gives an uh, introduction to the grammar and also a list of uh, useful phrases that you might use in conversation with the cook. For example, this I want to inspect the kitchen today. Ini hari saya mau periksa dapur. There are also examples of um, certain uh, interesting, like racist kind of things. Really? <laughs> Tell so, me more. So you can see there's a note here. It says Chinese servants speak Malay very badly owing to their inability to pronounce certain letters. So R is always pronounced by them as L. Roti mm. therefore becomes loti. Yeah. Cream buns, clean buns. So, yeah, it's quite funny. So, so do you think that during the banquet, the prince was actually served more colonial, colonial dishes? Uh, well, the menu for the banquet wasn't published. Mm -hmm. But I would think that, yes, there is a good chance that more of these dishes would have been served perhaps to give the prince an idea of, you know, the kind of good food ca that can be had here. The secrets <laughs> yeah. of so, Malaya. Yeah. I was quite surprised with the Gula Malaka dish, actually, that it was actually a part of a hybridization of fusion of cuisine that the colonials actually brought the influences and actually changed the landscape of the cuisine in Singapore forever. So I'm really excited that actually there's a high chance that colonial dishes are being served at the banquet um, because it will be quite boring just to serve traditional French food, right? Now comes the million dollar question. What does a hundred year old colonial recipe for gula malaka or even curry puff taste like? I am a self-trained chef and I am attempting to recreate the grand banquet that was held here for the Prince of Wales when he visited in 1922. So far, I have not been able to find the actual menu but I did find a colonial cookbook from the 1920s with recipes for dishes that I can potentially feature in my banquet. So, the familiar dishes like curry puffs and gula malaka which was served during the Prince luncheon. So I'm very curious to see 
how it will taste and uh, if it's any good to be served during the banquet. First, the Gula Melaka. A straightforward recipe involving chilling both sago pearls and molds and then serving it with coconut cream and Gula Melaka syrup. But unlike today's version, there is no pandan. Next, the curry puff. The colonial version uses a classic short crust pastry. The filling has no potatoes, just curried meat which is not cooked beforehand but stuffed raw into rectangular parcels. And the puffs are baked, not fried. Okay, colonial curry puffs. The verdict, the pastry perhaps can go a bit thinner. You can imagine a pie crust kind of thing. But the flavour is not too bad. And here, we have our guru malaka, sans pandan. Oh, not too bad. I'm not missing the pandan too much. It is what it is. <laughs> it is sago, gula malaka and coconut milk, which is a great pairing, naturally. Well done, Colonials. I still have more testing to do, but these dishes have got me thinking. Maybe my banquet can be less French and more British Colonial? So I'm here just finalising the menu for the banquet. And I've decided to go all out and feature only hybridised colonial dishes. So I think to celebrate a menu that's truly uniquely Malayan, it's much more interesting than classic French dishes because these are uniquely us. Our history has intertwined and created these dishes. It's a much more interesting menu and closer to my heart actually. My banquet will feature both gula malaka and the curry puff, as well as mulligatoni soup, and good old rendang spaghetti. There is a recipe for rendang. It has less spices than uh, rendang today, but they actually sort of serve it with spaghetti. I think that was really, really interesting. That's gonna be our main course. But before the big day arrives, I need to find out how these banquets actually look like. The tables, the entertainment, the decor. So I head to the National Archives to meet with archivist Franz Go to find out more. I'm looking to recreate the banquet of 1922 when Prince of Wales came to visit Singapore. Do you have anything to help me visualise how it's supposed to look like? Okay, well, we don't have a specific photographs of the banquets for mm -hmm. the Prince of Wales in 1922, but we do have this uh, very exciting collection, the Mike Gorey collection. Maybe I can show it to you? Yes, please. Yeah. This is Mike Gorey. It's a handsome young chap. Yeah. Mike Gorey was the private secretary to the governor of Singapore, Sir Franklin Gimson, from 1949 to 1951. Mm -hmm. And um, Mike Gorey eventually settled in Singapore and he became a Singapore citizen in wow. 1979. And this is a very special collection because it gives you a first-hand account of the private life and official life of a British government official mm -hmm. at a time when Singapore was actually undergoing important transitions in the 1950s. So although the period differs slightly, it will give you a sense or a glimpse of what the banquets were like mm -hmm. um, in the 1950s. Very nice. Franz shares that as private secretary, Mike Gorey was involved in organising many state ceremonies and functions, including those for visiting British officials, such as the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Mr James Griffiths. This is Mr James Griffiths. As with all the visits, there will be a dinner party, usually held at Government House. And this is the seating arrangement for a dinner that was mm -hmm. held at Government House and given in honour of Mr James Griffiths. That is a huge yes. table. And if you can see, Mr James Griffiths is seated next to Lady Gibson, who's the wife of the Governor, and opposite the host, Sir Franklin Gibson. And over here would be Mike Gorey, the private secretary, so would the seating plan for the Prince of Wales banquet be similar to this? Well, I can't say for sure, but usually for the formal dinner functions, the long table format is preferred. I see. So would you know what kind of entertainment is usually provided for these kind of banquets? Yes, if you look at this um, invitation, this is an invitation for a dinner to be held at Government House. If you notice, there's a table oh, arrangement here. And your entertainment programme on the other side. Nice. The entertainment is usually provided by the Singapore Police Band and sometimes a dance item is thrown in. Usually it's a ballet, I a see. ballet performance. Very nice. 
Do you have any photographs of uh, the banquets in the government house and how it looks like? Well, um, there aren't any photographs in this collection, but we've got a photograph here. This is the ballroom at Government House where most of the banquets were held. So you can see it's very grand. Tall ceilings. It's beautiful. But before I go, Franz has one more photograph to show me. This is a photograph of Mike Gorey enjoying a piece of curry puff. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I see the guy behind really enjoying the curry puff. It's a perfect photo to end this. Thank you. Even though the Michael Gorey collection is about 30 years after the Prince of Wales visit, I think it's still a very good reference point for how the Prince of Wales banquet was being held. The whole sitting plan, there's even a couple of music choices that we can play. They all have a long table formats, and definitely I'll be using it for our banquet. So this is the most grandest table we have ever sat in this house before. For the first time ever, we have tablecloth. Also, we follow exactly one of the invitation cards with nice table settings and even the program as well. And for the 1920s touch, feathers. So I'm just going to finish up a little bit of the food, get changed and get ready to welcome the guests. So this journey is really fun. It's exactly what I wanted to do, which is to see our history through the lens of food. So before this, I never knew anything about colonial cuisine. So I always thought that the colonials ate what they wanted, you know, they just ate their Yorkshire pudding. So that's been interesting for me. So here's the first course, Malikotoni soup. I'm really happy with how the food turns out today. I try to keep it as authentic as possible and follow the recipes with the tea and I think the rendang pasta came out surprisingly well. Good on you, Colonials. Definitely going to be looking more at our food history in Singapore because I think there's going to be a lot more to be discovered. Maybe these old dishes can help to inspire new dishes to be added to our Mexican collection. Thank you for coming to the banquet. Cheers! Cheers. When shadows fall, my thoughts return to memories of you.